Hey everybody, welcome to God Quest. I'm your host, Miles Young. We're gonna have a great time. We've got a special guest here, Pastor Caleb Adams from Memphis, Tennessee. We're gonna have a great time. Well, welcome to God Quest. We are in for a great discussion today with Pastor Adams, and uh, it's gonna be a great discussion. We're gonna talk about the faith stretch. The faith stretch. The faith stretch. And uh, this is your second time on God Quest. The last time we talked about the five-fold ministry. Yes, I remember that. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful conversation we had. Uh, and before we get started, I, I want to do a little shout-out. I want to shout-out to uh, entrepreneur, businessman Chris Lombardo and his team at Nomos. Uh, they just provided God Quest with some uh, merch, some coffee mugs. So I'm drinking uh, my... Uh, warm beverage in my God Quest cup. Thanks to uh, No Moss. Chris Lombardo, thank you and very I, much. I promise you, the water tastes better <laughs> coming out of this cup than out of a bottle. Uh, Try this cup. Yeah, and then I also want to give a shout out to a dear friend of mine, one of the most talented guys I know, Evan Grizzle. Pastor Evan Grizzle Amazing from guy. Wilmington, North Carolina. He is a Tremendous musician, singer, preacher. Uh, he and his wife, Ashley, are just amazing people. He recently wrote a brand new book about leadership, and it's called The Leadership Game Plan. And uh, this is a very good resource for pastors, leaders, youth leaders, people working with teams. Uh, it's about developing a game plan for managers, mentors, teachers, leaders, and it's very practical. He gives you some steps. He gives you some exercises, some series of lessons. And so a uh, shout out to my buddy, Evan Grizzle. Thanks for the book. I read it and thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I'm going to put it to use. And even uh, thanks for the little note there, uh, Brother Evan. We wish you and uh, your church in Wilmington uh, a, a, a big God bless you. And so I highly recommend this book by Pastor Evan Grizzle. Brother Adams. You are uh, an amazing pastor, one of the great apostolic churches in America, Memphis, Tennessee, on Interstate 40. Uh, you're coming in, into Memphis, headed west. As you come into Memphis, there you are on the right, a miracle church, uh, about to pay off your mortgage. Uh, and just, y'all have already done one expansion, getting ready for new expansion. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yesterday, uh, morning, last night, tonight, we just came out of a leadership session, and then tomorrow night. This has been a focused effort for our church where you're talking about leadership, maybe in a dimension that not a lot of people go, and it has to do with the realm of blessing. And as, as I listen to you teach, uh, I listen to you preach, I watch what God has done in your ministry the philosophy and the principle that blessing is a must to do the work of God. It, it just emanates from you. Yesterday you talked about, uh, I think you called it the faith stretch. The faith stretch. Faith stretch. So I'm going to borrow your title, and that's the title of this episode is the faith stretch. I, I'm just going to turn this over to you, and I may interject with a few questions. What, what do you mean when you call this the faith stretch? Well, we looked at the uh, passage of Scripture from Genesis where Jacob was dying, and his dying act was to call Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, mm -hmm. to pronounce a blessing over them. And, of course, the pronouncement of a blessing was very important in the Scripture and I believe that when someone is blessed, something is imparted in that blessing that wasn't there prior to the blessing coming. So it wasn't just this symbolic act of, well, bless you. Right, right. There was, there was about to be something transferred. Some kind of impartation. And, of course, the custom back in the Bible days was to put the bulk of the blessing on the oldest son, and a little bit of the fragments of what was left over would go to the youngest. And so the scripture goes. So that's in, tied to birthright. Yes, so you see yes. That in Jacob, he saw that tied that, to the, to the he birth. wanted that first position. That's right. Being the oldest son, it was it was a big deal. And of course, when you look at the sons of Joseph, there's a whole lot to observe there. 
uh, Joseph went through all the mess that he went through, uh, going into Egypt, sold into slavery, put in Potiphar's house, and on and on the list goes. But after Joseph is out of prison, he gets married, they have a child. The first son, he named him Manasseh. The word Manasseh means forgetfulness. And Joseph said, because God helped me to forget all of the toil and all of the stuff I endured in my father's house, God brought closure, he brought forgetfulness. And of course, we know that as apostolic people, when we experience a new birth, getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost, having the blood of Jesus applied, getting our sins washed away, that brings closure mm -hmm. to our past. And while we're still aware of what we did and what it was like before we were saved, the sting and the pain and the guilt and the shame that we carried prior to conversion, we don't have to carry anymore because we had that Manasseh experience. But the second son of Joseph was Ephraim. The word Ephraim is fruitful. And Joseph said, I'm going to name this child Ephraim because God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my, my affliction. affliction. And so right there, Joseph is giving with the naming of his sons what should be the testimony of every apostolic person. We experience salvation, and that's, that's where the forgetfulness is. The past is gone. But after we have the Manasseh experience, God wants us to go in to experience Ephraim, and that's fruitfulness. So you said something. i see if I can get the quote. I wrote it down. You said something to the, the effect, which will take us into the stretch, is you said that what God wants you to become is greater than what you have overcome. Right, right. Unpack that. Yeah, so here's the thing. and Let's, let's step into the scene, if I can, of the, okay. of the blessing, because this, this illustrates it. So here we have Jacob, he's dying, he wants to pass on the Abrahamic blessing to Joseph's sons. And so here we have the old man. He's laying in a bed. He's about to die. He, he understands that he's just got hours to live. He tells a servant, go bring Joseph. Joseph comes and he brings these two boys in. We don't know how old they were, but they were still young. They weren't full grown. And the Bible goes into great detail to describe the placement of these sons, Joseph brings up his boys, and Joseph is intentional to put Manasseh, the firstborn, on the side of Jacob's right hand, because okay. the right hand was the hand of power, yeah. the hand authority. of authority and blessing. So it was the right hand that was going to pass the bulk of the blessing. But Joseph took the youngest son, Ephraim, who was still going to get a blessing, but just not as much. He put him on the left hand of Jacob. And the scripture said that when Jacob reached out his hands, that he did so wittingly, or, or the old English word from knowingly, he took his left hand and did the unthinkable. He placed it on the hand of Manasseh, the son of forgetfulness a son that represent what God had done in the past. And he took his right hand, and the Bible said he stretched it. He stretched. And he touched the son of fruitfulness. That's the faith stretch right there. There it is. And so had he done what was comfortable been and easy. natural. Been easy. Been easy. He would have just put his hand out. He would have put all of the attention on the son that represented what God had done in the past. But instead, in his dying moment, hmm. he understood God's got something more. There's an Ephraim. There's the son of fruitfulness. And I'm going to die stretching my hand to touch the dimension of fruitfulness. That's the face stretch. That, that is so powerful. Now, here's where this applies to us as apostolic people. A lot of our preaching, and, and rightly so, is bringing people to the point of salvation. And then after they're saved, we spend a lot of time preaching what God did when he saved them. Mm -hmm. 
We preach Acts 2.38. We preach the oneness of God coming out of the world, repenting, forgiveness, and mercy, and grace. And then we spend copious amounts of time unpacking the theologies that have to do with our salvation, and we should, yeah. and we must. We have to have a Manasseh. You can't have Ephraim until you have Manasseh. So there's got to be some closure to the past. But I'm afraid what happens with a lot of us, we don't ever get in a stretch mode. Instead, we take our right hand, the bulk of our energies, and we let it rest on just celebrating what God did at salvation. We shout about Manasseh, but fruitfulness, the possibilities of what we can become, of what we can do, mm. of, of what God will add and bless to our life gets very little attention. But what's going to happen is we have to realize that even though we, we're we like Jacob, we don't feel like doing things at times. Yeah. Jacob had just a little bit of energy left. He, he, yeah, he, what, leaning upon his staff. Leaning on his yeah. staff. But he takes that right hand, and there was something in him that said, you know what, I'm going, to, I'm going to be fruitful. I'm putting the bulk of my effort into the future. I want to touch fruitfulness. I want to be fruitful. Wow. There's more for us. I've seen that not only happen with the salvation experience, I've seen churches that get locked and every pastor, me included, there's the temptation to rest upon what God has done. Right. Because you get tired of the stretch. Right. And it, it's a lot easier just to do what's comfortable. Right. But God, in your preaching yesterday, it stirred me again. God is calling us to stretch. Uh, I was talking to a lady in my church uh, that is a, a very educated highly educated, multiple languages, uh, working in medicine, home, home, homeopathic medicine on a, a, a top level. Uh, very, very intelligent uh, Asian lady. She told me today, and we weren't even discussing this, we were discussing issues with osteoarthritis uh, and uh, arthritis in the body. She told me that Asian people very rarely struggle with arthritis. Hmm. And she said, because have you ever gone to a park and seen Asian people going through, and like you think it's karate, you know, I don't yeah. know about all the martial yeah, yeah. arts. And she told me what the terminology is. She said, what they are doing is stretching. And she said, stretching reduces arthritis. Wow which is the joints don't work like they used to. And so here, you know, I, I'm not, I, I can't speak to that medically. I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of like a Joe Rogan moment. This is someone, someone told me this, you know, and I'm, I'm repeating it on a podcast. But this highly educated woman told me this, and she said because that resistance and that stretching, it does something to the joints. It does something, there's a flow. And so churches get locked up, you know, that, you know, Arthritis cripples the hands. Right. And that hand that is closed not only can't give, but it can't receive. That's right. The only way that hand can receive is it's got to be open. And uh, I, I feel that sense of a call to stretch. We're living in turbulent times. We're dealing with uh, chaos. Uh, and the temptation is just circle the wagons. Let's protect what we've got. Let's hold on. Let's hold the fort till Jesus comes. But the men and women that are breaking out of that, that are pushing and stretching, I see God doing some, some really great things. It's happening in Memphis. I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeing it there. You're, you're stretching. And when you get in the stretch mode, just like in the physical, stretching increases capacity. <coughs> when, we, when we go stretching and worship, you know, it's human nature just to sit back, yeah. to have at least one or two services a week where it just goes <laughs> to it. But, but we need to be in the stretch mode. Yeah. We need to stretch and giving. The, the human nature is like, you know what, we have what we have and we've been blessed, so there's no need to really press forward and mm -hmm. do anything special. But the worst thing we can do 
is quit stretching because if we're going to touch the fruitful dimension, we're going to have to do something that is contrary to nature. We have to stretch beyond what we are comfortable and we've got to touch a frame. And so I've just figured out you know, as a, as a pastor, I have to stay in a stretch mode. I've got to keep a challenge in front of me. I, I had one uh, pastor friend, a great, great man of God, and built one of the absolute greatest churches in America today and left a great legacy of leadership. And I was talking with him, and he talked to me about how when he started in his ministry, his very first church he pastored, they got into a building program, remodeled. He said, from in my 20s all the way up into my mid-50s, I never got out of a building program. Eventually, he built one of the nicest uh, edifices in America. It was just, just yeah. astounding. And he said, I remember he talked to me because later on, uh, things, the church kind of went into a period of decline. And he told me, he said, I, I can trace the decline that we experienced in my later years of ministry to a particular day. He said, all of these years, decades, I'd been in a building program. But he said, we had just built this big building. The grounds were immense and immaculate. And he said, I remember riding around the outside of that church, just surveying all of what God blessed us with. And he said, I thought to myself, everything I ever dreamed of building and doing for God We've got this facility that's paid for hundreds of people in the church. And he said, I finally realized I had reached the pinnacle. Wow. And he said, where I missed it, he told me this later, he said, where I missed it, he said, I should have had another mountain to stretch to. But he said, I didn't. Mm. And he said, because I hit the pinnacle, the only place to go was into a period of decline. Oh, wow. We have to stay in stretch. And right now, there's hostility in the world. Evil spirits are going on the rampage. Yeah. This is not the time for us to lay back and get comfortable. It's time for us to stretch. And I believe God's going to bless ministries that stay in stretch mode. You talked about tonight in our leadership session with uh, the leaders here at our church, you talked about increasing capacity, which, yes. is, which is a, a way of stretching. Yes. You know, I've had two knee replacements, and the pain of therapy post-surgery, those, you know, I had lived for years with knees that didn't bend because of severe injury and abuse, arthritis set in, and muscles had atrophied. But post-surgery, there's a window that you've got to do the pain of stretching and bending and pushing. And uh, literally, there's times where uh, the pain was almost un unbearable. The stretching of trying to get that knee to bend. It had not bent for years. But the doctor said, if you don't do the due diligence of bending that knee, you're going to lose the ability for it to ever bend. You've got a window. I think we've got a window right now. Yeah. I'm watching God do some incredible things in some incredible churches. But as I look around the world, I see the darkness closing. Yes. I think we all see that. And the, the, it's getting narrower. And we've got to take advantage. And if we've ever thought about stretching, it needs to be right now. Pastor, preacher, saint of God, businessman, mom, dad, student, whatever you're going to become, Right now, you need to stretch. You need to increase your capacity. You need you, you and I, I'm preaching to me. I mean, you have stirred my spirit this weekend, Pastor Adam, that we cannot be satisfied just, just with what God has done. And he's done wonderful right. things. Greater right. are his works, mightier are the works of his hands. Understand that. But he didn't call us to just look and brag on what he's done. He is the ever-present one. He is the omnipotent one, the omnipresent one. And he's not through. And it's like the old preacher said, 
He said, if you think God's done with miracles, signs, and victory, he said, just take a trip down to the grocery store, and if he's still making green beans, <laughs> he's still performing miracles. Yeah. So now's the time to stretch. And like we say every, every week on God Quest, it's a wide world of wonder. Yeah. There is, there's a world of possibility for your ministry, your family, your finance, your dreams. If you're young, figure out what you got to do to increase your capacity. Stretch yourself. Don't be like everybody else in the youth group. Don't be like every other young couple. Don't be like, I, I don't want to be like every other church in town. I want to stretch myself. Thank you, Pastor Adams, for being with us today. And uh, I, I thank God for the, the good saints at, at Memphis for allowing you to be with us on this weekend. And I know those watching God Quest have been blessed. So get on this journey with us. God's got something great for you. Hey, let your friends know about God Quest. This thing's growing. We're making an impact. Thank you for all of those that have sent me uh, emails and texts and what a blessing it's been. And those around the world that have uh, tapped in and let us know that it's making a difference. Hey, this thing's not a geographical boundary thing. It's for everybody. So join the quest. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week on God, God Quest. Bless you.